Talent Management Talks with Kristen Harcourt, brought to you by the McQuaig Institute. Welcome to McQuaig Talent Management Talk, and today's podcast, I'm excited to have a guest that I'm sure a lot of you know. We're going to be speaking with Lori Rudiman. Lori is a speaker, a consultant, a writer. She's done quite a few shifts and pivots, and I'm interested in, in hearing her take on a lot of things in the world of HR. I also love that HR, HR Lori is a disruptor, she's bold, she does things differently, um, she questions things, um, and she stands her ground. That's something I really like about Lori, because sometimes people don't agree with what she has to say, but she still stands her ground and she supports it, and she gets into healthy debates when she needs to. So welcome, Lori. Hi, everybody. Well, thanks for the welcome and thanks for the introduction. I really appreciate that. You make me sound like a nice person. Thank you. That's nice. <laughs> so when I was thinking about doing this podcast, um, one of the reasons I thought right away of Lori is I was inspired by a post that you wrote uh, recently, Lori. And you were talking about CHRO panels, and you've been to lots of different conferences, seen CHR pa CHRO panels. And one of the things you, you found um, with all of these panels is that, you know, a lot of the same questions were asked, the same answers come back, and what you'd love to see is more meaningful questions. So I thought I want to bring Lori in and ask her some of these meaningful, meaningful questions and have a really good dialogue. Well, thank you so much for the invite. I think one of the exciting things about these conferences is that regardless of who's on stage, the real action happens in the audience. And so, Kristen, I saw you at the Work Human conference in Orlando. And for me, that conference brought together so many great and amazing people in our industry, uh, thought leaders, consultants, practitioners, people who are doing the work in the trenches. So it's OK to have a panel of chief HR officers up on stage saying the same thing over and over again. You get that at every conference, but work human, the, the uniqueness of it is that it's so much about making connections, making viable connections, and then bringing those relationships and those lessons learned home. So I don't know how you felt about that conference, but I wasn't a fan of the panel, but in general, that conference exceeds my expectations. And I may be biased because I work on the marketing for it, but I'm also an attendee. And normally when I work at conferences, I don't go to sessions, but I absolutely participate in that event. And what was your favorite session, Lori? Well, I, you know, I love one of the uh, speakers there who's a second time speaker. His name is Pandit Dasa and he's an urban monk and he talks about mindfulness and meditation and there's a theme at that conference about taking care of yourself, self-care, sleep, wellness, and making sure that you're the best that you can be at work so that you can be in charge of the people agenda and pay attention to talent and really mean what you say when it comes to your employer brand and your mission, vision, values. And how can you do that if you're a worn down HR lady? So Pandit for me was really grounding and really practical. So that's who I enjoyed. Who did you? So I, I really enjoyed every single person that I heard speak, which is not something you always hear at a conference, but there were so many speakers from different walks of life, different um, bringing different views and uh, my, my favorite would have to have been and I'm sure everyone's been saying this consistently Michael J Fox the um, humility and optimism and is just authenticity it was pretty powerful I think a lot of people were were very moved and crying in that room and it was just because we felt um, like you were you were really getting to hear someone speak from the heart and and passionately believe in what he's saying So I, I really liked him and Amy Cuddy as well um, right. Everything about the happiness piece, which I, I think there's a, a misconception that you know happiness is this we have to go around with rose-colored glasses and about really what happens the neuroscience behind it and what you can do to change your brain synapses and actually do a lot of those things internally with your brain to actually um, change some of that positivity and uh, I thought they did a really good job of explaining some of the research and data to support the all of the happiness uh, happiness and positive psychology I don't disagree at all. And you know, one of the things that really struck me is that we had three or four 
chief HR officers up on stage after hearing all of this, the science of happiness, the um, importance of being human and working human, and those individuals sounded like consultants. <laughs> you know, they sounded, they're, they're lovely people, accomplished, lead amazing organizations, and yet I think there's something about being in that position as a chief executive in human resources where you wear armor and you wear a shell, and I just wish they would have pulled that armor back a little bit on stage. That was a little disappointing because I wanted to get to know them as individuals, as human beings. What were their biggest mistakes? What were their issues in life? How did they overcome all the different challenges in their careers to get to a position that 0.1% of all HR professionals will ascend to? I wanted answers to those questions. I didn't want to hear about culture and <laughs> all the buzzwords that are out there today because frankly, that's not what got them to where they are. What got them is probably a keen sense of politics and an understanding of human behavior and building really great relationships and being empathetic at the right time. That's what I wanted to hear about. Yeah, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about you with you today, Lori, too, is getting to know about Lori, the person behind Lori. Um, one of the things I also wanted to ask you, just to, to quickly go back to the work human, uh, one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about that conference is, you know, what they're really talking about around the whole person and, and humanizing the workplace. And I know there's a reason why you get involved um, and as a consultant. As part of that conference, you obviously believe in, in some of that messaging as well. What do you think um, this shift means in terms of workplaces uh, for you? What does work human look like? Well, um, I hope what it looks like is really understanding the whole employee and what he or she brings to the workforce on a daily basis. I hope it's about empathy. I hope it's about relationships. I hope it's about making lifelong connections. But even if it's just about taking a break and laughing with your colleagues and really um, having a moment where life isn't so serious, I'll take that. For me, in my own personal career, work was always very tedious. It was very hard. I didn't enjoy what I was doing for a living for a lot of years. And, you know, it, it took a moment of reflection. I always felt like a victim, like I'm working in human resources, and it stinks, and I hate it, and my colleagues suck. And finally, <laughs> I was about 30, 31 years old, I had the realization, oh, my God, it's me. I'm just really bad at this job. It's not good for me. It's not healthy. And I'm really making other people miserable. And it's hard to come to work every day and see people and know that that sour look on their face is caused by you. It was caused by me. They hated working with me. And it was really like a shift, a moment where I said, oh, God, I've got to do something different. Unfortunately, I have a limited amount of skills. And one of those happens to be human resources. So you're right in that I pivoted. And I just tried to be more of a human being. And I thought, well, I'm good at writing. I've been blogging secretly for a few years. I've amassed quite a readership. Maybe I ought to do that and see where that takes me. Now, I had all sorts of benefits and privileges in my life that allowed me to make a pivot. But I think there's a message in that for a lot of people that if you're miserable and <laughs> you're suffering on a daily basis, while there are all sorts of institutional reasons why you're suffering, part of the reason why is that you're making a choice to suffer. And you can make small and different choices to suffer less, maybe, on a daily basis. So I still suffer. No job is great. But, um, you know, people aren't as miserable around me anymore. And I'm very proud of that. <laughs> now, now I, do, I do make some people miserable consistently. I can't really do anything about it. It's my face. <laughs> or the fact that, you know, I don't like to have fun or whatever it is, you know. Some people will always not like me, but it's the number is smaller these days, so I feel better about that. <laughs> so, I mean, what, so, so what are you doing now? What did that shift look like? So, so it sounds like it's also a, a moment of self-awareness, taking a step back, being introspective. And then when you started to do that, where did you start to realize you wanted to make that shift and where did that, what did that look like? Yeah, well, I definitely knew I wanted to write. It's something I'm good at. Like, I just know this about myself. And I think maybe I'm lucky because a lot of people don't even know what they're good at doing. And yeah. so I, I have that advantage. I know that I'm a semi-decent writer. I'm good on the Internet. I knew that. And so I thought, well, 
you know, it's the Wild West. I'm going to take a stab. I'm going to try writing, which led to speaking, which led to um, consulting, quite honestly, because writing and speaking don't always pay the bills. And I realized that I knew something intrinsically about human resources ladies, people who buy HR technology. So now I make a living consulting with HR technology companies, really big ones and really small ones. And that has led me to uh, pivot in a different way, which is, holy smokes, I'm a badass marketer. <laughs> I didn't know that about myself. But at the age of 40, well, 41 now, I can say I'm a marketing professional. So it's quite a portfolio career. But one of the things that I do try to do is say yes to something at least once. So if somebody asks me to do something crazy, I generally say yes, which nice. is how I fell into work human. You know, it was like, well, we're working on this conference and here are a million reasons why it'll probably not be great. And we need your help, Lori Rudiman. And, you know, they had a vision for it. They knew it was going to be awesome, but I, you know, I said, all right, let's try it. Let's give it a go. And in the second year, first year it was awesome. Second year we kicked butt and we're on track in the third year to really just light the world on fire. And whether I'm a part of the conference as a consultant or not, I will always be an attendee. It's really meaningful to me. So yeah, say yes. I just say yes, at least once. Yeah, that's really, really good advice, right? If it scares you, then you should say yes. <laughs> well, well, you know. <laughs> well, yes, it has to be a line. There's this line. Um, and maybe not. The line is different for everybody. but yeah. Absolutely. I agree completely. Um, so you brought up social media, and you have done such a great job of building your brand. I think some of it just happened. It just It's just you being you, and it just organically grew. But there's so much talk now, of course, on building your brand. And so what kind of recommendations? I mean, whether it's the world of HR, whether it's people not in that world, it's, it's important now. You know, it is a world of, of social media. You know, what recommendations do you have around that? Right. You know, I'm, I'm conflicted because I have the brand that I have because I was early. And I don't take that for granted. I had no competition back in 2004 when I started blogging. It was me and like six other people on Blogspot. No joke. I mean, there was nobody out there. And then when I outed myself, it was me, Chris Dunn, Jennifer McClure, my friend Lance Hahn, an evil HR lady. That was about it. Like, there weren't many people out there. And so I benefited from being in the right place at the right time. I think now we talked about fine lines. There's a fine line between having a brand and taking yourself too seriously as a source of media and entertainment. You're not a media company. You're not a bottle of laundry detergent. You're not a brand. You're a human being. You have a soul. And some of the social media platforms out there, I think, are so uh, debasing to human beings. And they get us to act and behave in ways that are just humiliating and really not to the best of our own intentions. Like I know really great men and women out there who are not egomaniacs and they're not narcissists and yet they're on Snapchat and they're in their 40s really acting like they're in their 20s working out some family of origin issues or working out issues from their teens and their 20s and it's breaking my heart and yet they're not alone and, they, and maybe it's me like maybe I'm just sensitive to the cringeworthiness of all of this but I think just the real life is always harder but better than social media life you know real life you feel love you feel loss you feel the complexity of it all social media is just an illusion and if you buy into it too much you're the chump so like don't be a chump like get on there be curious open up a twitter account open up a snapchat account do whatever it is you need to do to feel like you're part of a movement but also have people in your real life who love you and love those people more than their online avatars. I think that's that's important. I, yeah, I, I absolutely. Just, it's a mess. And I, mean, and I think the other thing around social media is how you're using it too, because I know that, like, I, I found you, Lori, on, on social media. I found Jennifer mm -hmm. McClure on social media. Like, all of those people. Uh, and that's one of the things I love when I go to conferences. The sessions are great, but the bigger piece is those connections, right? So you meet people, you start to have conversations, and then to meet them in person and be able to continue on those conversations. And 
that's and what you're describing again I think that's because it's the human component that that was the catalyst that was the platform where you met them but it's always that face to face and those conversations and those connections where it's the community right that's where you actually feel con connected is that real genuine community that gets formed I hope so what I worry about is that some of these social media tools really drive us into a form of agoraphobia where it's easier to connect online and behind a screen than to take those connections into the real world because oh my god someone might think I'm fat or I'm ugly or I have bad breath or they're cool and I'm not and it starts to really eat away at some of our own um, you know issues around ego and we find ourselves behaving in very insecure ways and what I saw during the recession is people really gravitated towards these social tools to look for jobs but they couldn't get out of their basements they couldn't make the step into going to the networking meeting going to whatever association meeting that would drive the interaction because they were a little bit insecure they were a little bit afraid so I think when these tools are great they're great in forming initial connections but push yourself outside your comfort zone. Go make a connection in real life and be willing to be rejected. I mean, that's the real world. Before we had Twitter, people used to say, I didn't like you face to face, right? You know, they didn't hide <laughs> behind a DM or they did it via email or I don't know how they did it, but we used to have conversations about these things or we ghosted. But now it's just so easy to disappear or, or to assume things. And I just I'm really worried about some of these tools and I'm also really sad that I push these tools heavily without understanding the social complications that you know sometimes we all seem to be having a conversation but we're all alone in our own pods and still mm. feeling lonely and isolated so mm. I feel a little responsible for pushing tools without understanding the implications yeah well I think it's like that's anything a that's a bummer I'm sorry about that no, I think it, I, for anything, it's about also having a balance and how you're using it. Are you using it in the right ways? And I, I think whether that's social media or anything, you know, with distractions, right? We're in a world now where people look can quite often look for distractions and looking for things in, in all the wrong places. And I think that's where, you know, things like even meditation and going for walks and going for runs and being in nature and getting back to what's really important and those things like you're saying around social media, which are not always real it's some almost an illusion um, that you know it's the onus on the person but it's now it's become almost this thing where people need to almost to really take a step back and, and perhaps reevaluate how they're using it well I'm also afraid that recruiters and talent acquisition professionals have an unrealistic uh, unrealistic expectation of candidates so we see something on paper and we expect it to be glossy we see a candidate walk in our office and we expect it, that person to be glossy and to look like, you know, a polished bottle of Tide, right, and have their brand in order. And human beings are inherently messy and complicated. We all make mistakes. We all fail. All of us have bad breath, like, you know, like all of us are short or tall or whatever. We're not perfect. And I think uh, some of these tools skew to the beautiful, skew to the pretty. And I worry about the implications for the disabled or people who are different or differently abled or think differently or look differently or don't fit into a package. So while I agree that personal brand is important, and my dear friend Jennifer McClure talks about getting your personal brand on lockdown, I also think uh, we're human. And that event reminds me that people are human and people are flawed and they're beautiful in those flawed ways. And also disrupting, right? You know, change and innovation and all that kind of stuff happens from not following what everybody else is doing and doing your own thing, right? So, which you've always been the disruptor, right? In a good way, right? You're, you're, you're challenging things, doing things differently. So let's go back to your childhood now. <laughs> <laughs> When you were five, Lori, no, we'll go that far back, but if you think about, if you were to go to your younger self as you were starting to get into this career journey and some of the things you've learned over the last, you know, 20 years after you graduated from school, what are some of the things that you learned that not necessarily you would do differently, but you would maybe some advice you would give to yourself? Yeah, I think I have one lesson that I'd like to share. That lesson is to be gentle. I think we as people are often not very kind to ourselves and so we go into a situation at work or even in our personal lives and it's very stressful 
and we fail or we you know make the wrong mistake with our words and then afterwards we ruminate we beat up on ourselves and I don't think that's a really good way to live and I don't think that's the way you learn a lesson anyway but for years I was just so tough on myself so hard the standards that I had for myself were harder than anything anybody put upon me and when I didn't meet those exacting standards I was relentlessly mean to myself and I think that's not a unique experience. I think that's a universal experience for people who are high performers or people who work in corporate America or people who um, had weird childhoods, right? And they want to just make sure they don't make the same mistakes. And if you're just a little kinder and a little gentler to yourself, I think there's an opportunity to just maybe not make the mistake over and over again because when you're caught up in the cycle of the last mistake you've made you're not aware of the mistake that's coming down the pipeline so that's my advice for young women and young men just go easy forgive yourself be kind be gentle awesome so when you're thinking about talked briefly about failure but also not just failure and I love that you something if something kind of scary that you think I'm gonna go for it what are some of the things that you specifically do to, to work through fear? Because we all have fears. There's no getting away from that. What do you find when you are having some fears about something? What, what helps you to push through? Um, alcohol and Xanax. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the, the middle-aged way of dealing with things. But one, actually, one of the things that's been really important to me is making sure that I'm mindful about my alcohol intake and I'm mindful about anxiety. So I take a lot of pride in my wellness and my self-care ritual. I'm a runner. You know, I, I do the meditation apps in as much as they ever work, right? You know, I make a go at it. But I really, uh, when I'm feeling anxious or when I'm feeling like something's wrong, I try to ask myself, why is this happening? Now, that's come with a little applied knowledge, age, wisdom. It's easier for me to do. But I hope somebody listening or somebody watching in a moment of fight or flight can just calm themselves down, learn breathing, learn relaxation, and, and maybe not make the same mistakes over and over again. So, you know, that's kind of a long, really obfuscating way of answering your question. But you know, it, it's good to push. Like I'm about to run another marathon in October and I'm scared. Am I going to get injured? Am I not going to fuel right? Am I not training properly? But I'm also trusting the process that I'm following. I, I have good people in my life who give me good advice. And so if I stick to my training schedule, if I do my, you know, daily and weekly workouts that I need to do, if I eat right, it's all going to come together. So maybe surrounding myself with the right people with good advice is one way that I make taking risks a little bit easier. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. You surround yourself with a support network that's there to encourage you and, and talk through things with you as opposed to saying, yeah, 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 don't do it, right? They're, they're probably also going to sometimes challenge your thinking if you're saying, no, I can't do this. They'll say, why not? <laughs> all the time, all the time. And they're also challenging me to get out of my comfort zone in that you know you can't run a marathon if you're drinking margaritas all the time right and you can't run a marathon if you're eating chips and salsa for breakfast which you know I like to do so these are things that I mean this is just a small stupid micro example but these are things that you know I know I shouldn't do and having a good support network around me is certainly helpful but you know, people talk about having a good board of advisors in your life and in your career. My friend Jessica uh, Merrill Miller, Miller Merrill, I don't know why I just screwed that up. Um, JMM, she always advises on having a board of advisors. And I think if you work in recruiting or talent acquisition or HR, it's really important to surround yourself with smart people in HR, but also outside of HR, who can give you advice whenever you hit a bump in the road professionally. So I have those in my life. I have a great board of advisors, and you know I hope you do too, Kristen. Yeah, no, I think it's important. I like that, that you're describing the diversity as well. You don't want just people in your field. You want people from different walks of life, different um, coming at it from different perceptions. And But you always want the love and the support and people who are, are going to have that attitude, right? 
uh, and I like the mindfulness, and I'm glad that more organizations are understanding and get on board, getting on board with the mindfulness uh, when they truly get what that means, which really is, you know, getting centered and taking that step back, and before you react, being able to actually respond to things and question why you're being triggered and all, and all those types of things that can actually change the outcome of things. And it's great for workplaces. I. I definitely think more leaders that can come from a, a mindful conscious approach it's only going to help all those people that are working for them um, you know live up to their potential and, and be more effective as well yeah I don't disagree but mindfulness isn't cheap it sometimes doesn't scale and it certainly isn't for everybody I mean it's definitely an acquired taste and it's a journey and I'm a little worried that uh, people talk about mindfulness and they think it's a quick hack to profitability and a quick hack to like productivity increases and it's not it's not mm -hmm. so. no 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 quick fixes so if we're gonna go to the HR world <laughs> <laughs> all right let's go to the HR world <laughs> let's go to the HR world Lori what do you think HR is sometimes doing to hold themselves back well, it's funny that this keeps coming back to work human because when we saw Amy Cuddy speak on stage, she talked a little bit about the difference between competence and trustworthiness. And that's a theme in her book, which is called Presence. And it really struck me that a lot of HR professionals that you and I know are very focused on competencies. So making sure that they're certified, they have their MBA, whatever it is. And they don't take the time to focus on establishing relationships with executives to prove that they're trustworthy. Because the thing about HR and recruiting is they can't really learn it in a manual. You can't really learn it in a handbook. You learn it by doing it. And oftentimes you learn it by being thrown into a situation and just having good judgment. So succeeding, and this is something I would have loved to have heard from people who sit in these CHRO panels, succeeding in HR isn't about reaching the next high water mark with a certification or with an education. It's about establishing relationships with executives and having the organization's back, having their back, having employees' backs at, excuse me, at the right moment. So the difference between competence and trustworthiness is super important. And whenever you can not brag about your latest HRCI or SHRM certification and brag about having a great relationship with your CEO, do that. Like develop those relationships and don't worry about studying H really studying HR. Do you know how many people enter this field with no background in HR? There's no hard statistic, but all statistics are a lie, so I'm going to make one up. I think it's about 80% of people enter in HR without having an HR background. Okay. <laughs> don't, you, don't you feel like that's right? Who goes to school for HR? Only recently did for-profit universities start selling degrees in HR. Before that, it wasn't a thing. It was people with uh, psychology or humanities backgrounds or English degrees like me. So, you know... I, I think focus on relationships and don't worry about competencies. So if you think about, you know, what would you like to see in those ideal HR people? What what do you think in terms of, I hate to use the word competencies because <laughs> we're trying to get away from competencies, right? But if you thought about, you know, like, like I mean, let's talk about the future of work and where organizations are going. And if you pick, like, what would be on your wish list of, how do organizations need to evolve and what is HR's role in that? Yes. So I think when you can, your HR leader should be hired for high cognitive processing speeds. This is something that Chris Dunn taught me and I think he's right about that. You need an HR leader who can think quickly and think on her feet. Okay. You also need people who are collaborative and think in terms of bigger projects and not specific tasks. So it's great when you're really good at managing open enrollment. But what does that really mean? Open enrollment is one piece of a bigger total rewards package, which is one bigger piece of an employer branding strategy, which is one bigger piece of a consumer or business strategy. So I think the future leader in human resources is going to be thinking about things from a bigger point of view, a bigger perspective, and not really focused on those individual components that make up HR. She will hire for that, but she's not going to be able to do that. You know, I once had a VP of HR who got the very basic definition 
of HIPAA wrong, which is something that's important in America. That's about privacy and healthcare. And a lot of the like HR biddies were making fun of him. Oh, he doesn't even know what HIPAA is. And I bet he doesn't even know what COBRA is. Guess what? That guy was making a half a million dollars, you know, plus a bonus. He didn't have to know what HIPAA is. That's what you're for, right? <laughs> He's functioning at a higher level and really thinking about how do we attract the best and the brightest talent. So, so tell us, um, some, what are your passions outside of your work? And I, I definitely hear writing is, is one of them. What are some of your other passions? What, what makes you really happy and excited? Well, I like coming on video podcasts and talking about myself. I think that's, <laughs> yeah, I think that's interesting. I think a lot of people enjoy that. Um, I, also, <laughs> I also like volunteerism because I like to brag about how great I am in the world. So I like that. That's true. And, you know, I like working with old people. You know, it makes me feel good about myself. So, yeah, like those are the things I love. But, you know, most of all, I'm just a nerd. So I like watching TV and reading books and going to the beach. So that's what I do outside of my uh, world online. It's really quite a boring life, and it's quite a human life. And I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. So just to end it off, if you were to win the lottery tomorrow and you could do whatever you, anything you wanted, what, what would you start doing? What, how would you want to contribute to the world? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people know this about me. If I won the lottery tomorrow, nobody would ever hear from me again. And that's <laughs> like a knock on the people I love. But I would really go into stealth mode. I would really try to figure out where I could have a bunker on a Caribbean island and settle in for the long haul. And then I might create a fake person. In fact, I might have already won the lottery, and this is my fake persona that I've created. But um, I would create a persona in which I could look like I don't have a ton of money, so nobody would like, try to kidnap me or rob me, but do good. So I would donate to causes around women. I would donate to causes around animals. I would donate to causes around food, because I think one of the really tragic things in this world is that we don't properly nourish our bodies and it shows at work, it shows in our life, it shows in the way that we interact with one another. We're hopped up on sugar and fat and salt and uh, we're addicted. So I would like to do some work around that. That would be my, that would be my passion. I love that. It, it, one last question for you because I know you were saying earlier that you were lucky and got to figure out your purpose and you, you really realize it sounds to me like you're in your flow when you're writing and that's you're, you're contributing and using those special gifts. Um, do you believe in that? That you know? Do you feel like some people are not necessarily doing their purpose? They're kind of doing their day to day to get to get a paycheck, um, and that we can be spending more time to be clear around what that purpose is and doing work that is going to be in our flow where we can make the biggest impact and contribute. So I have two answers to that. Like, well, yeah, duh, right? It'd be great if everybody could do that. But unfortunately, the way that our Western economies and all of our economies are set up is that only a certain segment of the economy can do that and maybe not even that like most people go around doing what makes the most money based on the very basic skills that they have and to have a job and to like provide for your family and the next generation of your family is just an honor and a privilege in and of itself you know when you have children you take on the responsibility of making sure they're fed well making sure they have access to education clean water, they're safe, they're secure, they have a house or some sort of a, like shelter to stay in. And a lot of times, if you can do that, you're better than the previous generation in your family. So I think it's kind of a privileged and arrogant thing to say that everybody should be able to follow their passion and their purpose. I'm lucky in that I get to do that. But everybody can have a hobby. Yeah. And for me, writing was my hobby. And yeah. You know, in a lot of ways, I kind of miss the days <laughs> when it was my hobby. But um, everybody should be able to have a multi-dimensional, wholly differentiated life. I really believe that. So you could be a mother, but you can also be a dancer or a singer or a painter or an artist. Carve out a little bit of time. It doesn't have to be your job, but find a way to vary your interests. Because somebody who's really obsessed with one thing is really boring. Like that person is the most boring person to talk to at a party because they don't have anything else to talk about except themselves and their interests. So even if you have a job that you hate and you can't walk away from it, 
do something that's creative or go take an archery class. I, I did that and lo and behold, I'm really bad at archery, but I learned that. So I, I really, I strongly believe in hobbies and that's something that I tell people who come to me and say, I hate working in human resources. How can I do what you do? First of all, you may not like what I do for a living. And second of all, why don't you explore your creative side? Why don't you, you know, go sign up and run a 5K, do a couch to 5K program. Do yeah. something that takes your mind off of that really crappy job. And then some answers may come from that. That's what I did. Yeah. No, uh, and do you agree, like one of the things I, I actually took from Work Human, and I don't know if it's because of the content, but I also feel, and I, this is in workplaces and just the world in general, that there needs to be this shift from me to we. Instead of it always being about me, 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 when you take that mindset of, you know, how can I help others? How can I make an impact? How can I find other people? Like, take it from that approach. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I actually feel more connected to myself and happier and more fulfilled when I am taking more of that others as opposed to it being all about me, me, me. Well, you know, you're awesome, and that's why you can do that. What I'm really afraid of is that we are now living in a society where uh, we use social media and our cell phones in such a me, me, me way. And sometimes even when we're participating in a we moment, it's only for a me gratification. Right. And so I agree with you. I think the world needs to shift to a we focus because clearly what happens in China just doesn't happen in China. It now impacts the entire world. You know, something that happens in Paducah, Kentucky can have ramifications in Iceland. So we are connected, whether we admit that or not, but there's so much dividing us right now, and that makes me a little bit worried. Yeah. Well, we are promoting today to go from me to we. Lori and I, it's time okay. to shift from me to, to we. <laughs> Wait, unless it interferes with like my time doing podcasts about myself, and then forget it. Yeah. You know? oh, and no marathon. No, right, no. right, right. Totally. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> so me to we on, on you know, the hours of like four to six every day. Everything <laughs> Lori, Lori Rudiman. Baby steps. You got to start totally. somewhere. Totally. <laughs> Lori, thank you so much for being part of this podcast today. I loved our conversation, and I hope everyone got to, to know Lori a little bit better. Where can people check you out when you're on social media? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, they can check me out under my name, Lori Rudiman, and all versions of spelling it will lead you to me. So uh, you can also Google Work Life Cats, believe it or not, Work Life Cats, and you'll find me as well. Also, I hate HR. Google that. You'll find me as well. So I'm, I'm everywhere, unfortunately. So yeah. I'm, I'm there. But thank you so much for having me, and I hope uh, you know this wasn't a train wreck or a tire fire, and I hope people really <laughs> found it useful. So yeah. It's always awesome when we're talking with you, Lori. Thank you. Talk soon. Bye. Bye.